Now I look to Simon Van Toten, the international officer at the union, to open the case for opposition. However much I enjoyed the proposition's riveting rhetoric on history, shared values, and geopolitical realities, I cannot help but notice that they have failed to determine, delimit, and delineate the key parameters of this motion. What does it mean to look to a country for global leadership? It means not only that we can, but also that we should rely on American guidance, initiative, and coordination in solving global issues. Any weaker interpretation, and that does not reflect this motion, which specifically tells us to look for leadership, not mere cooperation. Secondly, who is this house? For me, raised in a Dutch village, speaking in this historic British chamber, this house is Europe, a Europe that the UK, despite Brexit, very much re remains a part of. We, as Europe, should oppose today's motion because it is both unfeasible and undesirable. With our eyes on the present, the American people no longer want to bear the responsibilities of global leadership. With our eyes on the future, the US will no longer have the capacity to pursue meaningful leadership on its own. With our eyes on the past two decades, with our eyes on Guantanamo Bay, Iraq, and, well, the orange elephant in the room, the US has shown itself to be unsuited and unreliable as a global leader. For these three reasons, we as Europe should stop looking and start moving. But first, it falls upon me to introduce tonight's proposition speakers. You've just heard from Laura Smith, Dr. Laura Smith, who admirably is on a second PhD in American history. As excess officer, she has unfortunately not managed to lower this society's skyscraping membership fees. <laughs> Then again, how much access can we reasonably expect from a former pupil of Harrow School? <laughs> <laughs> next to speak, next to speak is Sir Malcolm Rifkin, who served as a cabinet minister for an impressive 18 years. I truly hope that his speech today will be more successful than his story leadership bit in 2005. <laughs> <laughs> then we have Congresswoman Jane Harmon, born in 1945. She remembers, she's old enough to remember the United States that we could still look to for global leadership, yet she's also young enough to remember what went wrong, given as she herself supported the invasion of Iraq in 2003. <laughs> Last, Last but not least, last but not least, we have, I know it's very exciting, last but not least, we have James Cleverly, MP, Minister of State for the Middle East and North Africa. He definitely has the diplomatic rigor required for that job, given that in 2010, he cleverly called the deputy leader of his coalition partner a uh, dick on Twitter. <laughs> Mr. President, these are your guests, and they are indeed most welcome. <laughs> Eighty years ago, when my grandparents grew up on the continent, America did not only free them from Nazi Germany, but also helped rebuild the continent. 30 years ago, when my mom, when my mom, my dad fell in love in times of peace 
the US had just won the Cold War. It was an open, strong, and reliable partner for Europe. How different is that today? Today, the American people no longer want to bear the responsibilities of global leadership. When it comes to military leadership, Biden promised to restore the Iran nuclear deal, yet he hasn't. In addition, Biden pledged that diplomacy is back before, indeed, blindsiding France last month by secretly negotiating AUKUS. And then there is Afghanistan. The only leadership we saw there was NATO allies uninformed, translators left behind, and citizens left at the airport as the planes took off. When it comes to leadership in trade, Biden has neither ditched Trump's tariffs nor has he rejoined key partnerships. When it comes to humanitarian leadership, Biden guaranteed that in his first 100 days, no one, no one would be deported. Yet, in his first month alone, he threw out 26,000 people. Under Trump, it was America alone. Under Biden, it is truly America first, simply spruced up in fluffy rhetoric. And make no mistake, that is the will of the American people. This year, the Pew Research Center found that 11% of Americans, only 11%, want the US to be the single global leader. 78% wants it to sh share this role with other countries. And the majority of that group doesn't even want to be the most active state. Instead, um, the US wants its allies, Europe, us, to step up our game. So sure, we can look to the US for global leadership, but they will look right back to us, like a dog puzzled by its own reflection in the mirror. <laughs> now, even if something magically triggers the US willingness to lead, it no longer has the capacity to pursue meaningful leadership on its own. America's military might is no longer a guarantee for power and influence. The failed wars in Afghanistan and Iraq are persuasive proof for the limits of brute force. That is not even to mention cyber warfare, a battle that the US has already lost to China. Not my words, just the words from the ex-Pentagon software chief in the Financial Times this month. As US military power loses relevance, Soft power and economic power are increasingly important. On that front, China will soon surpass the US in terms of GDP. Then India will follow. If Europe wants to defend its long-term interests, looking to the US, leaning on the US, is simply not good enough. Our, counter, our, our passive gaze will only be counterproductive if China invades Taiwan, if Russia attacks Ukraine, or if climate catastrophes worsen. Now, finally, allow me to move the goalposts in favor of the proposition once more. Suppose that the American people did suddenly want to bear the responsibilities of global leadership. And suppose that the US does somehow retain the capacity to pursue it. Even in that case, you cannot possibly condone today's motion for normative reasons. Since 9-11, the US has failed to be an ethical and reliable global policeman. When President Bush used Guantanamo Bay to detain and torture people indefinitely without lawyers or trials, I expected Europe to react Yet, our silence was deafening. Then, when the hidden weapons of mass destruction turns out, turned out to be non-existent, I thought, now that our troops have been misled, surely we will stand up, yet we remained seated. Then, when the American people elected a president who withdrew from the Paris Agreement, directly threatening future generations, I thought, surely now, Europe will grow up. Yet, here we are, debating. How did we suddenly become a civilization who does not care? Are we too spineless to shape our own priorities? Are we so afraid of China that we are no longer an honest ally of the US, but instead a paralyzed partner, a folded footrest? Before walking 
through these doors. I want you to stop and think about the United States' unwillingness and incapacity to show global leadership, which makes this motion unfeasible. I want you to reflect on the United States' deeply questionable moral compass, which makes this motion undesirable. I want you to worry for our planet. Give me one minute. I want you to worry for our planet, which their president refused to protect. I want you to give thought. <laughs> one second. I want you to give thought to those human beings abandoned in Afghanistan. Europe can no longer afford to look, wait, and ponder in the hope of a better tomorrow. That is why you should vote no today. That is why you must vote no today. Thank you.